We are in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20. So if you've got your Bibles, open them. <laughs> go to Revelation 20. It's an easy one to find. Just go to the end and then like flip back a few pages. <laughs> easy peasy. Um, if you don't have a Bible, we've got we've got them uh, on the ends of each rows. Do be reading there together. I would love for for that to be a continued staple of our church fellowship. Is that we read the Word, we go line by line, verse by verse through the Word. Um, so far, we've uh, we've covered a ton of stuff, right? We've this is the this is the end times. We've seen the rapture of the church. We've seen an apostasy happen, and then the rapture of the church. We've seen the Antichrist coming on the scene, rallying different nations, gathering them together, um, starting to implement a new world order, a new one world currency, a one world government, one world religion that's founded on uh, on the devil, ultimately, declaring worship of himself. He says he's going to claim, I am God, and really truly filled by Satan himself, who is a fallen angel. Um, and so that's uh, what we, that's what we've seen. We've seen judgment after judgment after judgment that God has rained down upon the earth. And we can look at that going, oh man, that's sad. People are getting killed. People are get, like, suffering. But what God's doing is he's turning up the temperature. He's making it uncomfortable. He's eliminating that person who's like, yeah, maybe there's a God. I'm not really sure. There are no atheists at this point. They know that there is a Lord. There has to be, and they're either for him or against him. It is very, it's a very clear delineation between the two. And if you're in Camp Jesus, there's still some suffering that you're going to go through, but, it, but the end awaits. There's a light at the end of the tunnel for those people, right? It talks about the mark of the beast that's going to be coming on, and without that mark, you're not able to buy, sell, trade. Basically, you can't be a part of culture. You're going to be scrounging for your life in a war-torn, a, a stricken world. And so uh, wild stuff that we've seen. We saw also the... Um, the Battle of Armageddon, where nations are gathering together, millions of people to make war with God. Uh, that was uh, that was wild, right? And he comes back and just speaks. He, sa- he says the, the word of, that comes out like a sword, and it annihilates them, right? So just they just drop dead, boom. Um, and and that's where we left off is the it's the second coming, as the Bible talks about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Powerful event um, where he comes with the armies of heaven, clothed in white. Uh, except for him, he's got red on his robe, <laughs> the blood of the enemies. But um, he comes back, the return, right? The, the beginning of making things right again. And isn't that the way, isn't, isn't that what we see in the world? We see that there is a, a need to, to right the wrongs, right? We see that there's a need, we look in the, at all the injustices of the world. We see how terrible things are and how deceptions rampant and, and there's, there's lies and mistruths and half-truths and manipulation and power grabbing and, and corrupt, just, just corruption and, and uh, you know, huge amount of lust in our culture especially and just so much stuff. And there's a, there's a need to have things made right. And the second coming of Jesus that we talked about last week is the beginning of that, where he's starting to make things right. He's taking those broken pieces, if you will, that we sang about, right? He's putting things back together from, from a creation standpoint. Talks about the end, of, uh, chapter 19 ended with the coming of Jesus, and, the, and he takes the Antichrist and the false prophet, and he throws him into the everlasting lake of fire. Everlasting lake of fire. We're going to pick it up here. At, oh, Actually, I have a question for you guys. Um, what are some things that you can earn? Respect. 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 Money. Respect. Trust. Respect. Had it lost it. Had it lost it. <laughs> what else? What else can we learn? Earn? Yeah. A salary. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. There, you know. Uh, I like those things. I want to. I want to point out here that there's something that you that you can't earn, grace. And that some of the songs that we that we sang today talk about talk about grace, and they talk about the grace that is freely given by God. And we're going to unpack grace today. And even when we see God's judgment, there's grace in it. Could God? Why, why did? Because I've, I've been wrestling with this. Like, why would God do seven years of tribulation? 
It was just, he just wants to make people suffer. No, we know that's not true. God is willing that none would perish, but all would come into repentance and everlasting life, right? He's Huh? The world, for sure, the, yeah, the world earned that judgment, didn't they? If there's anything we earn on this, yeah, we earn, we earn judgment, right? The, the wages of sin is death. We deserve punishment. We are, cause, cause we're guilty. We're guilty. There's no, I mean, won't do a show of hands, but people that sinned yesterday, you know, bad thought, bad heart. Bad look and use, your use of your eyes, what you listen to, what you thought, all those different things. It's just, we aren't we just corrupt? Everybody except Marcus over here is corrupt. <laughs> <laughs> we're just, we're flawed beings. And so, but, and so we can think, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do better, right? How many people have thought that? I'm gonna do better, I'm gonna be better. Okay, the heart of that is good, right? Your desire to be better is a good thing. Better by his standards, not ours, right? Better by his standards. That's a good thing. In that, that's kind of us, us working to get it. Well, let me tell you this. You can't work to get the grace of God. If you could, it's no longer grace. And some of you might be going, yeah, that's good. Or another, some of you are like, well, I don't really know what this is. We're going to unpack grace today. And I see here in these last seven years, especially, even in the judgments of God, these, the most horrific, brutal judgments of God on an unrighteous world, even then, there's grace in that because he could have just said, I'm done. And then all those people who may have come to him, or who, I should say who would have come to him, wouldn't. And they're not in heaven, they're in hell. And so it's an act of grace that God even has the tribulation period. So even in the darkest stuff, there's grace. The grace of God can be seen. And so, church, I hope your, eye, I hope your eyes are going to be open to how to walk in the grace of God. Question? That's it. I mean, he wants people to come back to him. Yeah, yeah. And he's not. He says, "I'm not. I'm, I'm not again going to judge to flood the whole earth." Right. So, he's not wiping everybody out like he did before. Right. Although uh, more people could have fit into the ark, <laughs> but um, they didn't come. Uh, anyway. All right. So let's look at Revelation 20, verse one. We'll look at the first three verses, and then talk about that. Revelation 20, verse one. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so he could not deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Pause here for a second. Now, it mentions the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit here is different than the lake of fire. Okay, the bottomless pit is hell, specifically. Hell is not the same as, as the everlasting lake of fire. Okay, um, more on this later. We'll cover it. We'll, we'll come back to this. So, uh, so uh, verse 2 here, um, it says, He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Now, some denominations... Um, you know, or some Christians may, uh, and even scholars, right? They hold the view that Revelation is strictly a symbolic book. Um, it's an allegory that uh, is only meant to be taken figuratively. Um, I would say many. I mean, it, it's Revelation, like I mentioned when I first started this, like there's a lot of churches and denominations that won't even teach it. It's like, I don't know. Well, God, God put it in here. <laughs> we should know. There's a special blessing placed on the people who read it and study it and, 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 and meditate on it and take it in. Even as we've, in our journey, we've gone through it and it's like, it's keeping our eyes open to the workings of the enemy behind the scenes and the need to press into Jesus, right? Um, so when they come to this verse, verse two, and they see a thousand years, they go, oh, well, that's any length of time. That could be any length of time. It's just an allegory. It's just a, a large number because a, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years, right? Gre borrowing from David's psalm that he wrote about that. When the Bible says a specific number of years, 
it means a specific number of years. The most plain reading is almost always the case for the Bible, right? So when it says a thousand years, I'm going to say that's a thousand years. Um, there's going to be a heal. Like I mentioned, the second coming being the beginning of like a, a restoration of the world. The world is jacked up. <laughs> it's, there's buildings, cities have been destroyed. There's been fires. There's been famine. There's been pestilence. There's there's bodies everywhere even, like right? And so that's when Jesus, God was saying, hey, carrion birds, come and pick the bodies clean. I know it's gruesome, but that's what is in the Bible. And so there's there's a cleanup. There's a, you know, and it's a big, that's an ordeal. And and so there's going to be a, a healing process there. So yeah, a thousand years, yeah, I can see that. And, and um, there's no there's no reason to take these years as anything but what it actually says. The most plain reading of the word leads to the correct interpretation here. Um, and we are to be vigilant, right? Um, the because the, the, some people read this and they go, well, Satan's bound now. He's bound now. It's like, ah, uh, no. <laughs> no, we see him. That's why, the, that's why Peter says, be vigilant, be watchful. Your, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. And he's prowling around, man. He's lurking and he's waiting for an opportunity to strike. So he's alive and, alive and well and he's not chained in hell right now. He is, uh, he's walking. He, as a matter of fact, he has access to, to the throne room. You know, he can, he can just look at the book of Job. He, he approached, he approached, uh, God the Father. So, you know, that's just something to consider there. But, um, not to get on, the devil too much, but um, Satan, aka the devil, in the future, he is going to be captured. At the end of all this, God's like, I'm done with you. Now, remember, note this: Satan's a tool that God uses. Now, God doesn't cause him to do those things. He's given, he's 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 given authority, but God is still sovereign, and He'll use the enemy's tactics even for the good. I think of uh, Romans 8.28 that says, All things work together for, good, for the good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And so God will even use the junk, the tough things, the terrible things, the tragic things in our life to bring about good. He does that. He's done it with me. He's done that with many of you. And here we see that Satan's just a tool and God's done with him for a while. He's like, I don't, you're not needed right now. Not that God ever needs that, if that makes sense. He's like, we're not going to use you right now. I'm putting, it, I'm putting that away. You're, you're going to be put, put in time out for a thousand years, okay? And he's going to be in hell, a.k.a. the bottomless pit. Some have said that could be the center of the earth where there's no bottom because there's, there's no bottom. <laughs> you're in the center. I don't know. Maybe. But I'll say this. There is not going to be any demonic deception during these a thousand years. There's none. There will be no demonic deception. And we're going to see how messed up we still are because of, no, not we, because we're, we're going to be <laughs> raptured. These are, these, we're going to see how messed up the human, the humankind, the human species can be even without the demonic influence. Let's read on. Verse 4. John writes, he says, I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had uh, not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Verse 5, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Notice the repeat of a thousand years, thousand years, right? During these a thousand years, or the, the millennial reign, we could call it, we're with Jesus, okay? We're going to have our resurrected bodies. And there's going to be some people, though, that lived through the tribulation, Okay, there will be those who live through it. We've, we've talked about people that had come to Christ, right? Many of them, most, if not most, because there's active persecution that was happening during the tribulation period. Most have been killed, and they're going to be have a resurrected body at the, in the millennial reign. But there's some that made it through. As, for sure, the 144,000, 12,000 of these tribes, right? I think that was Revelation 12 that talks about this. And so... Um, those who live through the tribulation period, those who did not take the mark, uh, they, will, they will be in their bodies as, as, as we are now. So 
they're going to still have their sinful flesh, we'll call it, okay? Because they live through it. They, don't, they haven't died and been resurrected yet. Does that make sense, guys? Clear as mud? <laughs> That's what it's talking about here. <clears throat> These people may or may not, uh, well, they may or may not die during the tribulation, the, the uh, thousand year reign, the millennial reign. They may or may not. I don't know for sure. I was trying to figure, like, really dial this in. Sometimes scripture, you're just like, I don't know if, people, if there's going to be death during this period. I think so. Um, but lifespan does increase. Isaiah, if you guys want to take notes here, these are some good verses. I'm going to get throughout this. I've got some other notes for you guys to appeal to here. Isaiah 65:20 talks about this day. Uh, it says that the lifespan of, of humans would be extended, um, but not forever. Um, they're going to have kids too. A thousand years is a long time. <laughs> There's going to be some babies. <laughs> There's going to be millennial, millennial uh, babies. Some millennials, different kind though, <laughs> right? They're going to be populating the earth, right? Again, no demonic uh, activity though, no demonic deception. There will be a theocratic government then. It says that we're going to be ruling and reigning with him. Huh, interesting, right? Jesus, of course, is reigning as king. God is, that. that's it, man. Isn't that, gonna be, isn't that cool? Like this... What is right is very clear. It's going to be very clear wherever you go. Nobody's going to be arguing with that. It's just like, yep, that's it. It's going to be so refreshing, right? Um, Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 5 talk about this. We don't have to go there, but just, like I said, jot these down. Read, read these throughout the week. In verse 4 here, it says that the resurrected saints will rule and reign with them. It says, I, thought, I saw the thrones, they sat on them. Judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image, right? The resurrected saints will rule and reign with him. Luke 19, verses 11 through 27 talk about this. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. Talks about these things, okay? I love this. I love how scripture just, you know, it's all connected, man. It's almost like it has the same author. Spoil alert. It's God's word. <laughs> he had this from the beginning. Um, now note this here. It says, it says the rest of the dead were not to live again. Da, da, da. We rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Okay. Notice this. There's work to be done. <laughs> you guys get that? There's work to be done here. There's cleanup to be done. There's ruling to be done. There's re ruling and reigning doesn't mean you just, it's not, this is not ruling and reigning from a, a lazy boy recliner. <laughs> it's ruling and reigning like you're going to have dominion. Matter of fact, the, one of the verses I, I, I think one of the ones I share with you, Paul's talking about, it, he goes, hey guys, if you can't rule and reign over your own bodies, how are you going to rule and reign over angels when the time comes? Because that is coming. That's Paul's words. I'm paraphrasing. This is in Corinthians, because he's talking to the church of Corinth. He's like, you guys are crazy. You can't even control yourselves and rule your own bodies, let alone what it's like, what's going to happen in the millennial, like when you're reigning with Jesus? You're not going to be able to. So we're going to have we're going to have authority. We're going to be uh, judges over the you know over the world and 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 implementing the Lord's will on creation. We're part of the recovery. You know, we're first responders to the to the damage that's been done and kind of the the healing process. And then, of course, the people that live through the tribulation, like I said, they don't have the glorified bodies yet. There is still in us that propensity to sin, whether there's a demonic temptation or not, whether there's a demonic influence or not, there's still this part of us that's bad. It's part of the fall. It's part of the fall, all the way back to the Garden of Eden when they chose to defy God. But now, with this, what I want to point out is that work is meant to be a blessing then. This is, this is the after fact. I, I was thinking about this, I'm like, Oh, because we think of work and it's like, ooh, work, 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 you know? Oh, man, we don't like that. Chores, kids, right? Chores, ugh, ugh make it, ugh. <laughs> when God created Adam and Eve and he put them in the garden, what did he tell them to do? Huh? 
I can't hear you. Commit, just commit. They said to multiply, yeah, that's not work. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> um, tend to the garden. Work the garden. Plant the crops. Tend to it. See, I've given you all of the fruit and the seeds to eat. Well, you can't, that means you need to tend it. They were meant to do that. And part of the curse was there was going to be thorns, and, and this, now the ground's not going to produce what it would anymore. And, the second law of thermodynamics starts. Things break down. It's going to take work. And God even said, Adam, by the sweat of your brow. Work changed. Work changed with the fall, guys. God opened my eyes to this. Work changed after the fall. And now work became as we know it. Work. Blah. The grind. That's Monday. Hey, hump day, Wednesday. Friday, I'm off the sun. Cycle, cycle, cycle. Work is meant to be a blessing. And now here's the millennial reign, and there's a restoration that's happening. Ah, things are going to stop breaking down like they used to. Wouldn't that be a joy if you, if you built something and it doesn't fall apart, guys? Ooh, now it makes you kind of want to go, what else can I build? What gardens can I plant? They just grow. Everything I plant here grows. It's amazing. Sorry. Um, yeah, wouldn't that that would be a joy, right? Being able to build something and it lasts. Build a house, doesn't break down. Nothing wears out. All the electrics works just fine. I was closing my garage door yesterday. I'm like, whoa! I didn't even tell you about this, Adam. <laughs> and then I tried to open it and it didn't open. I'm like, oh no, another thing, right? Oh, another thing. Car breaking down on the road. Another thing, right? Work, I got to fix it out of time. All this stuff. Weeds. No more weeds. Or weeds will do something better, maybe. Maybe they'll be better for you. This, these weeds taste great. <laughs> I love weeds. <laughs> anyway, work, we're ruling and reigning with them. It's not work as we know it. It's a joy. Because we are, we are amongst other believers we are part of the healing process. We have oneness with, with the Lord. And so there's going to be so many cool things. Heaven is not just some kickback party and hang out and just feast. It's fellowship with the Lord, yes, and intimacy with him and relationship with him. But it's also really what was intended from the beginning. And it talks about, the, the, it says, um, Blessed and holy is he who is part of the first resurrection. Over, the set, over at such, the second death has no power. They shall be priests of God and of Christ. They will reign with him for a thousand years. So Jesus is reigning as king. We talked about that. Um, Jesus' resurrection was the first, right? He was the first fruits, right? So his resurrection was the first. Now, a resurrection is, is the glorified body. It's not just, so we've got Lazarus who raised from the dead. There's been multiple people throughout the, the, the Bible who's been, who've been raised from the dead. Matter of fact, one, an, over, an often overlooked uh, fact is when Jesus was crucified, the, the tombs opened up and people resurrect. Like they didn't resurrect; they revived. We would say they didn't have their glorified bodies. How wild is that, man? They walked around. Could you imagine? Oh my gosh, I'd be so frustrated if that was me. Why did you? I don't want to go through this again. I was, I was right. I don't want to be here. Call me when this is all over. <laughs> Get me back at the millennium in my glorified body. Uh, anyway, Jesus was the rest, was the first fruits. First Corinthians fifteen twenty. And then the martyred saints are resurrected. Martyred saints talked about the martyred saints in verse four. Martyred meaning killed for their faith during the tribulation period. They get resurrected. Okay. We will most likely be as well. We'll be resurrected as well. Those who have been raptured or died previously, we will be resurrected. If you if you died in Christ, as as forgiven, right? Um. When do we get our resurrected bodies? I'm, I'll be honest, I'm not 100% sure. Is it right at, at the moment of death? Is there a, a degree where there's like a, like time works differently in heaven? You know what I mean? Like I don't, I don't fully know. Uh, there's some really good scholars that I love that say, yeah, it's right after death, resurrected bodies. Other times they say, no, it's here at this point of time. Um, I lean towards right after, after death. Um, 
Let's see, right? You've got all the time in the world. If nothing else, right? That's like, where am I going to go? Like, time doesn't even, you know. Some of you people that are retired, you're already starting to experience that time. Ah, whatever. Hey, what do you do? Was it you that lost, lost a day one time? Was, was that you, Marcus? Was that you that lost a day one time? I'm like, dude, I was on the phone, right? And you're, talking, you're, you're, you're like, wait, is that tomorrow? I'm like, yeah. Gain days, lost day. I'm not putting you on the spot. Sorry. <laughs> it's happened to all of us, right? But that's kind of what happened. I remember when I was a kid, summer vacation. All your days just start, when you just have, when you have ample time, it's like, you just lose, like everything just one day kind of blends, right? That's okay. Well, that's kind of what's going to happen here in the millennia. Although time is still going on and there are days and all that stuff. But anyway, um, regardless of when you get your new bodies, there's going to be a resurrection. You want to be part of that first resurrection, right? We'll cover the second one in just a minute. So you want to be part of this first resurrection and these new bodies that we get, guys. We don't even know. We don't even know, right? No more sin. Won't it be nice to not have war within yourself? That the only thoughts you have are the right ones? The only feelings that you have are true. That means that you'll only feel what's right. You'll only think what's right. You'll only say what's right. You'll only desire to hear what's right. Oh, that alone would be a win, wouldn't it? Think of the, fr the freedom you have at that point. Whatever you, your heart desires, go for it, because it's going to be right. You want to think on that? Go ahead. It's only going to be the right thing. How beautiful that's going to be. There's no more pain, no more aches and pains. <sighs> Some of us went to Dollywood on Monday. My feet were messed up so bad for like the next two days. I felt like, like raw meat. It was just like terrible won't happen. You'll be able to run running all over the place, man. Be just fine the next day. No more pain, no more aches and pains. That bum knee that you got, gone, baby. Well, not the knee's gone. The, the pain's gone. <laughs> you got new ones. You got upgrade. You got a whole hardware upgrade to run the new software, which is the, uh, which is the, you know, uh, the, the resurrected body. No more maladies, the speedy travel. We see that throughout Scripture, you know, being able to just to be here, be there. Teleportation, man, it's cool. <laughs> we'll have a full understanding of God's heart. You'll know God. You'll know what he loves. You're going to be able to go give Jesus a hug. I can't wait for that. I don't know. I can't even think about it. I get all emotional, all right? Will we have interplanar... Uh, interplanar travel? Will we go check out like other planets? Like, there's an entire universe out there, in case you didn't know. <laughs> right? And we get excited when there's like a, a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse. It's like, well, this is cool. Man, wait until you go to this, you know, galaxy and look at these star systems and like, you know, wouldn't that be cool to go explore God's greater creation? of Like, man, that could be wild. I don't know. That's me speculating. Why is it there if we're not going to go look at it? But that's just my own thought. How about this? What if we just took our five senses? Some of you heard me do this before. If we just took our five senses that we have, okay, and just took what we have here and just expanded them. What if God, the resurrected bodies, and God just expanded them? So all of a sudden we're hearing what? New things. We're like, what is that? Oh, that's the sound of a caterpillar. Well, that's amazing. I've never heard that before. Well, isn't that cool? And now you're going you're to wander around for 20 years listening to new stuff. What does that sound like? What does that sound like? Wow. Yeah, yeah right? <laughs> you know, you just do that. Well, that's another thing. What if he took our smell and just gave us new smells? Oh, oh my gosh. Ooh, what's that? <laughs> you know, you know, it's like new smells, right? Amazing. How about new tastes? What if he just, you know, some of us, as we get older, our taste, we, you lose taste buds. You know this, right? That's why typically as you get older, like the stronger flavors come out more because you're, you're, you're damaged goods. What if God just gave you a massive sensitivity and all of a sudden your palate is like, you could taste all these different flavors. It's like, whoa, that's going to be wild. New colors? We see the, 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 the light spectrum, right? You've seen the, uh, there's um, red waves. What, what is it? What is it? Uh, ultra, there's ultraviolet and then there's, there's red as well, right? So like we can't... 
infrared, infrared, thank you. Like we can't see infrared. We can't see ultraviolet. You know, we, uh, and so, but we, we see that the scope, there's like this, if you see like the light range, the wavelengths of, of light, we only see like this little tiny por portion of it. What if God went like this, wham, and just gave us full like view of it? Like, <laughs> you'd, be like you'd be seeing so many different things. New colors. Things would look different. Blue is no longer blue. It's so, it has a it's a different thing because you're seeing it in all in its in, in its fullness. It's wild. There's been some people uh, that that have talked about uh, different um, uh, gemstones. That in, what's it called? What's that called? The absolute light? Is it is that what's called? Absolute light? Infinite light? Where it's like all of the all of it's the totality of of, of the fullness of light. What is it called? Full spectrum light. That's not what it's called, but there's a different name for it, but I think that's what it means. And if you shine that into there, these, these, they look different, right? They, and, and then there's, and so I uh, probably should have had this in my notes before I talk about it. But it's, look it up. <laughs> but it's talking about these, there's these precious gemstones that when there's that kind of light, they just, boom, they just gleam in this, in this it's prolific. Um, and uh, other ones that glow in like the natural sun, they're like, they look black and dead. And so interestingly enough, I'll cover, I'll cover this next week, by the way, um, because it talks about it. Th those gemstones are in the new Jerusalem that comes. They're in the foundations. It's, we'll, we'll cover that tomorrow. So that's a, I'll get it together uh, by next week. Um, so, so, but we're going to see this going to be new, new things to, to see, right? Feeling, you're, you're touched. There's not going to be any more pain like we talked about, right? This will be a spiritual awareness even amidst a war-torn and partially destroyed world. This is just me hypothesizing, just taking what I know about creation and just making it probably the way God would want it to be, right? So, I mean, there could be other cool stuff, too. The new bodies, good stuff, guys. This is what awaits us. When Jesus says, I go and prepare a place for you, it could very well be the new bodies. Back to this millennial reign, back to this thousand years. There's not going to be any more war. Amos 9, 11 through 15 talks about this. Israel will be the focal point of the earth. Isaiah 2, 1 through 3. Ezekiel 17, 22 to 24 talks about this. There will be no more demonic activity. We talked about that. There will be no idolatry. The Lord will be the focal point of devotion. There will be a rebuilt temple, interestingly enough. Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48 talk about that. Amos 9, 11 talks about that. This would be a temple that's not for the remission of sin. Obviously, there, is, there no longer remains a sacrifice to be made. Jesus was the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. These would presumably then, with this new temple, there would be a, a sacrifice of just an offering to God, just to offer to him as a, as a, as a I love you, a peace offering, that kind of thing. Um, animals and humans are going to dwell together safely, except for those that may be offered, I guess. <laughs> Isaiah 11, 6 through 9 talks about that. It says the lion will lay down with the lion. Kids will handle snakes, scorpions. How weird is that? You know, what? Yeah, right? I, I don't know. But, but that's just, well, that's my point. It's like Ezekiel 40 through 48 talks about the new temple. Well, there's gonna be, if there's going to be sacrifices on the temple, if there are, maybe it's just a visual remembrance of, of things as well. I don't know. There's certain parts, guys, that God puts it in there, but he doesn't explain it. Or he gives it to you later. And that's okay. I remember Chuck Smith. I started listening to his stuff again. Um, he's been, yeah, I miss that guy. Um, so Pastor Chuck would talk about different topics. And this is one of them, actually, you know, some of these things that, that I've covered today. And he's like, you know, <laughs> there's like a file. I won't do it. I won't do my Chuck impersonation. Um, there's a, he's like, sometimes I have a file, and it's on a particular topic. And I, I talk to the Lord, and I read, and I study, and I pray, and I don't get all the answers. So I just write down a couple things, and I put it back in that file, and I wait for more information. He goes, and sure enough, years might go by, and I get that back out. Oh, great. And I put it in a different file because it's been answered. He's like, I've got things I'm still learning, and that's okay. One day I'll figure it out. I'm like, yeah, don't sweat it. <laughs> you know, we'll figure it out because we'll be very clear. 
But here's the crazy thing. There will still be sin in this non-resurrected, uh, I'm sorry, there will still be sin during this millennial reign. Uh, there's going to be this non these non-resurrected saints, as it were, these people that live through the tribulation period. Um, and, uh, and then their sons and daughters, right? Um, they're, they're basically, they're gonna, there's going to be some people that are just kind of conforming to the standard. Uh, we'll talk about more of this in just a minute. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, something we want to look at there. Uh, I think I already covered this. Yeah, work is meant to be a blessing, not a curse. All right, uh, verse 7. Now, when a thousand years have expired, just like that, a thousand years. <laughs> Next verse. <laughs> when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. Well, yeah, it's been a thousand years. You can make a lot of babies in a thousand years, especially if you're living to be, you know, a few hundred years. Uh, verse 9, they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, that's Jerusalem. Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. <laughs> they did not learn from the history books. <laughs> you know, those who do not read history are bound to repeat it, right? And we see that in Scripture so many times over and over. We see it right here. And um, fire comes down out of heaven. There's this new rebellion that happens, right? The devil, verse 10, who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Ah, he's in a different place now. He's not in the bottomless pit. Now he's cast into the, the a lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. I've often struggled with this section here because you're like, Satan's in prison. Like, we're healing the world. Why do this? Why not just be done? <laughs> Can't we just push the button and New heaven, new earth, <laughs> let's do this thing. Why let him out again? He, he sucks. <laughs> so I've struggled with it. Why would God allow this to occur? Why not just take evil out right there? The, but the, so there must be a reason. There's got to be a reason for it. Again, Satan is a tool that God uses. Okay, He's always been that. He's always been a tool. Before he fell, he, was, he, was, he, had, he had a purpose. And after he fell, there was a purpose still. He's going to use it. Again, he doesn't cause him to do the wickedness. He uses, he's, he works with it. Um, so perhaps does, God maybe does this. He wants to show the depraved state of mankind. Even when I take him away, there's a need for salvation. There's a need because we are needing to be restored. We need a new body. We need the resurrected body. And so that's one aspect of it. Um, uh, it's also a test for those who lived through or were born during this millennial period. They've never had an opportunity to be even deceived. They haven't even had that opportunity to not choose God because everybody around us is a believer. <laughs> you know, the whole entire society is built on biblical principles. So, like, we're good. And then Satan gets released. Now there's demonic. In, in, oh, I don't have to choose this? And there's going to be like that. Well, then, yeah, I don't care. Because some people are going to choose not Jesus. They're going to choose to move away from us. It's crazy. How could they do that? Even living in a, essentially essentially a utopia, you know, where you have perfect fellowship with God. And, you know, it's amazing to me that that would be the case. They're going to choose. So it's a test for these people. They had to have that test so they could choose. Does that make sense? These Again, the people who were born during the millennial reign. That's what I'm referencing here. So there's this other gathering against God that happens. Apparently it doesn't take Satan long to start to deceive him. He's a powerful man. It's pres I presume that it's, it's not just him. He probably has his forces as well that are released. Uh, there's this final battle. This is the final battle to end all battles. You thought it was Armageddon, not Armageddon. <laughs> that, led the that led to the second coming in the millennial reign, but now this is the final battle to end all battles, if you can even call it a battle. They got together, and God's like, okay, great, you're in one place. Zap. There's no saving you. 
You've already tasted and seen how amazing I am. You've chosen not me. Enough said. So, and then God's done. Now he's done. I am done with these. I'm, I'm done. And, and the next chapter is amazing. I'm so looking forward to teaching 21 tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow next week. Next Sunday. It's amazing. I, it's one of my favorite chapters. We'll come there. We'll get there. Calm down, Tim. Satan's cast in the lake of fire. That's not hell. Okay? He's with, now he's with, Satan is with the Antichrist and the false prophet. They've been there, right? Cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Guys, forever and ever means forever and ever. There is no purgatory. You're either with God or not with God. That's it. The final judgment is the final judgment. And this is the everlasting lake of fire. There's no escape. It's permanent. And there is torment day and night. There is no escape of the torment. Church, I implore you, myself included, share the gospel. Share the gospel. Those people that you come across every single day, some of them are bound for hell. They don't have the grace of God upon them. They have not been forgiven of their sins. Their sins are still upon them that they have to answer for. They have not had God's grace yet. You can be the tool to bring that to them. Share the gospel. Invite them to church. Invite them to men's group. Invite them to women's group. Kids, invite your friends to youth group. Talk with them about, about God. It will change radically someone's life. Would you rather be forever and ever with Jesus or forever and ever in the lake of fire? No brainer. No brainer. And we know this. If you're on Team Jesus, you know this. You, this is nothing new. But we forget. We forget the severity of the judgment. We forget the severity of those who reject him. And may your heart be stirred that you have to, myself included, that we have to share. i got to look for opportunities. Because we talk about grace. Um, there is no, I didn't have it in there, I guess. There is no grace for those who reject Christ. They've rejected him. There's no grace. There's no after-the-fact grace. If you're breathing, there's an opportunity to receive the grace. If you're not breathing, it's done. You're either with him or not. All right, last section. This is cool. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea, oftentimes, by the way, the, remember the vision uh, that, that John would have, the sea represents society, culture. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one um, according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So here we see that hell itself, death and Hades, right? Hades included, uh, it was, basically, Hades was the Greek word for just basically the land of the dead, right? Um, that's why it says, yeah, so it's death and death and Hades, death and hell were just were cast into the lake of fire. So this, in, I think of hell right now as like a holding tank. It's like jail. They're wait, they're all waiting for waiting for their sentencing. They're going to have to appear before the judge. Old books are going to be opened, and then they get their sentencing, and that's the everlasting lake of fire. Uh, Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. You don't have to go there, but the, that's the parable of the sheep and the goats. That would be this. Uh, where it's the sheep or the goats. Which judgment are you going to be part of? Okay. We have this great white throne happening, right? 
The Greek word is thronos, which talks about where a ruler would sit. A ruler would sit elevated and, and uh, presiding over, right? To preside over, to rule from. Thronos, that's the great white throne. The believers, the Bible seems to teach that there's a different judgment for us. The, white, the great white throne judgment is the thronos. That's the God going to rule over them. Your consequence is this. You, and the books are open, it says. And the books will be open. All the dirty, rotten things that the non-believer has done is brought out before them. And, they, and let's, let's, go to the, let's go to the screen. Is that you? Yeah, that's me. What are you doing there? Oh, uh, yeah. I, yeah. And the shame, the shame. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Nobody thinks they're innocent. What do you have to say for yourself? I'm guilty. Yes, you are. You're sentenced to everlasting lake of fire. Next. No, we're not arguing. It's done. Next. Matter of fact, the Bible talks about, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, it says every tongue will confess and every knee will bow. So they're going to bow the knee. Yes, Lord. Maybe they bow first. I don't know. But they're going to be face to face with the creator God and realize, oh, crap, I'm wrong. And I'm a sinner, and I have nothing to say for myself to excuse myself. I'm guilty. God is perfectly righteous. He has grace. He gave, for, he gave plenty of opportunities and always does. Doesn't he give us opportunities? Again, this is the great white throne judgment that it talks about. It says that they'll be judged according to their works, verse 12, by the things which were written in the books. Everyone since the beginning of time will be judged upon this throne. I think lions are bad now. <laughs> of course, they won't be us, right? If you've rejected Jesus and his salvation, you are not in the book of life. The Bible says that we need to be in the book of life. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. Right? If you're not in the book of life, you're not saved. If you've said yes to Jesus and you've repented of your sin and you've received his forgiveness and the grace of God is now upon you, you have salvation based on the word of God, based on his work, not yours. And you are written in the Lamb's book of life. And your name is there. Did you check the, check the book? I'm right there. I think I'm right there. Yeah, we got you right here. Come over here, sir. Oh, no, not that. Not there. You're in a different place. And the Bible talks about a different place called the Bema seat or Bema. Some people say Bema. Um, I think it's Bema. Not Bama. Not Bama. <laughs> and that, that Bema seat is different. It means an elevated platform, a raised platform. Paul uses this in multiple places to talk about, talk about running our race. It says we're going to be judged. I think I wrote them down. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15. For those for you note takers. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15. Romans 14, 10. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. Paul's talking about the judgment. Talking, but he's talking to the church and saying our judgment. But he doesn't use thronos. He uses bema. And Bema, uh, you guys have seen, I should put it up there, you guys have seen uh, the Olympics, right? Where the, the people that compete, first place, they climb up to the tie one, right? Second place, third place, right? That's the Bema seat. Our judgment is not a, let's look at all your sins and answer for your sins. Guys, our sins were dealt with on the cross. You come before the Bema seat, it's as a friend to God, as God's kid, as God's children, one with the beloved. It's di that's different. That's daddy with his son and his daughter. Daughter, come here. Come here. Stand up here. Stand up here. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna look at, your, at what you did. And the Bible talks about how our works are going to go through the furnace, as if judged by a fiery furnace. So some of the stuff's going to get burned up. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, right? But then there's things that remain. And he goes, oh, 
good job. Well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. servant. And then we, and we, we know it's not us. We glorify him, and we enter into our rest. That's the Bama seat. That's what Paul talks about. He uses a different word, guys. It's not thrown off. We don't come to God as the, as the ruler, the judge, the, the, the sentencer. We come to him as daddy, as father, as his sons and daughters. And our judgment is based on the works. Yes, our works are judged, but it's our good works that are judged. What was the spirit we did them in? Right? That's the believer's judgment. Two lines, separation of the sheep and the goats, the Bible talks about. Right? And there is absolute ultimate power in the grace of God, isn't there? Do we deserve that? Did we earn? Yeah, first place, baby, I earned that. I trained hard. I worked hard. Studied. Pushed my body past the limits. I studied the enemy's tactics and I overcame them. Give me that first place prize. Yeah. Woo. No. We didn't earn it. It's by grace. Kidding me? So the Bible says that we're going to cast our crowns before the, 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 uh, the lamb. I think that comes up next chapter. Because we're not worthy. He's worthy. You can't earn grace. That's the power of the grace of God is so mind blowing when we really look at it. It's so mind blowing. May we learn to walk in the grace of God. May we learn to see the magnitude of the grace of God. This is not some, you know, hey, get out of jail free card. This is not like, oh, okay, thank you. Whatever. This is meant to be. A daily walk, a daily active mindset, front of mind, knowing the grace of God, experiencing the grace of God, right? At no point do we deserve it. At no point did we earn it. Look at this here. This is the last thing I wanted to get into. If you have questions on anything, by the way, this is a friendly reminder. Text those in now. Uh, we'll answer them. If you're wanting to walk in God's grace and really see like the magnitude of it, here's a nice little acronym there, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Many of you have heard this, I'm sure. God's riches at Christ's expense. The only way to have God's riches is at Christ's expense. Again, you cannot earn grace. Grace is freely given. It's only given through Christ and his atoning work on the cross. That's how, what makes that possible. God's riches at Christ's expense. And if you can't earn grace, guys, stop trying. Stop it. God is not... What can happen is we... we, we yes, we know this stuff intellectually, but then on a day-to-day -day basis, now all of a sudden we go back to, to uh, raw religion. And if I do more of this thing, God's more happy with me. You're already his kid, okay? Stop trying to earn his grace. You can't earn his grace. It's good, yes, it's good that you read your Bible daily. Yes, it's good that you pray for something. Yes, it's good that you are giving. Yes, it's good that you look for people to share the gospel. Yes, all of those things are good. Yes, I'm not taken away from that. But that doesn't make you in more favor with God or that you're in like a, that you are a super Christian or something. You can't earn more of his grace. It's fully given to you and freely given to you. So when you do read your Bible, you do pray, do those things out of love for him, not out of raw, you know, religiousness. That's what I'm saying. Grace is, the concept of grace is unique to Christianity. It is the only world religion that has this. God came, died, paid fully the sin, for sins, rose from the grave, and gives his righteousness, his grace, salvation to any who come to him. And doesn't take it back. 
That's huge. Game changer. Absolute game changer. Amazing, right? That's the difference between the sheep and the goats. That's the thronos or the bama seat. Which one do you want? I want to get up on the podium. Maybe I can, you know, be in the top 100. <laughs> no, but we're going to get, we're going to have our own little platform. If not, we're going to be ranked with each other. That's not, that was just a joke, bad joke. Um, you're going to, but, but we're going to be judged for our works, right? That's a different thing. That's a, hey, I have stuff that I want to give you. I want to high five you for the good stuff you did. Now, anything good we did, how did we do it, guys? Through grace. Let's cover this. Look at the grace. Look at the concept of grace. Look what grace gives us. It changes everything. The much more grace of God is a, is a wonderful thing. By grace, we are saved. We could stop there, couldn't we? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. That's enough. <laughs> By grace, we are saved. You got the verses up there, right? By grace, we stand. We're able to actually just be. We're not broken and, and destitute. We can actually stand in the grace of God. By grace, we are gifted by God. That's what the Bible says, Ephesians 4, 7. Wow. We have supernatural gifts that God gives us. That's his grace. I didn't earn those. I didn't do anything. I just said, yes, Jesus. Huh. I'm in. You're going to... You're going to give me gifts to use and, be, and to work in the, in the kingdom? Wow, that's cool. Look at the next one. By grace, we're rewarded in heaven. That's what we were just talking about. That's grace. Any good thing that I have that's in me, I didn't put there. The Holy Spirit put there. Church, if you are struggling with something, it needs to be less focused on how you can get this done and more focused on how God is going to get this done. I'm not saying you don't have a role in it. I'm not saying that self-discipline isn't a factor. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is far more, it's an empowerment and filling of the Holy Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, the Bible says. So if you're wanting change, good, healthy change in your life, it's, a, it's less of you trying and more of you surrendering. Oh, that's good right there. Thank you, Jesus, right? It's less of you trying to make it happen and more of you surrendering. Surrender to him. Lord, I can't do it. And he's like, ain't that the truth? But I can. Give it to me. How, I've been waiting for you for 10 years to give that to me. We have to sing that song, I Speak Jesus, right? All anxiety, fear, all that, all this stuff talking the release of it, right? What did God say? Uh, Come to me, all you who are labor and who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You're not meant to do it. And the more you bog yourself down, that's you. That's on you. Anything good in us, God put it there, and He wants to keep putting more stuff there, more stuff, more stuff. So surrender, surrender, surrender. And as you start then to operate, operate on a moment-by-moment, case-by-case basis amongst a fallen world, and you operate based on, on the Holy Spirit, and you're, you're, you're in tune with Him, and you're walking in that grace, now all of a sudden, amazing things are coming out of you. You're bearing fruit, the Bible talks about. Jesus says in John 15, 5, Abide in me, and I in you. And you'll bear much fruit. He even says this, Apart from me, you can do... Nothing. That means nothing of significance, meaning nothing of, in that Bema seat, you have nothing to show. It's like you didn't abide in me. Come on in, but you were apart from me. You were, with, you were of me, but not abiding. Walk in the grace, guys, and we get rewarded. Well, uh, the next thing there, it says, by grace we serve God. It's only by God's grace we can even serve him. Why would he choose to use us? You ever think about that? Like, why me? Why? Why? Why Why does he choose us to, to be the one that prays for that person? Why does he choose us to be the person that shares that Bible verse or this Bible verse? Some of you, maybe you're chosen and you don't even know it. But why? You know, the fact that he would even use us, we're not worthy of that. We didn't earn that. 
I can see why he picked me. <laughs> you know, I can see. I've, I've studied really well. God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, getting, making people scratch their heads. How did that guy have that wisdom? How did he share that in that moment? How did he do that thing? What? How? He, this guy's an idiot. And we're like, yeah, I'm an idiot. But Jesus, <laughs> I'm a fool. Tony is a fool. But Jesus. I didn't want to pastor, but Jesus, I want you now. <laughs> My heart's changed as I abide in him, but Jesus, right? That's grace. All the most beautiful, precious things in our lives, salvation, standing, standing in a dark world, being gifted by God, being rewarded in heaven to serve God, all of that is because of grace. It's God's riches showered upon us at his expense. So my encouragement to you guys is to allow God to bestow the much more grace of God. Allow him to wave after wave. It's like an ocean, man. Jump in it. There's much more. The Bible says where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Oh yeah, but I'm dirty and I'm wicked and I just messed up. I know. You're, that's, that's the pet that was already judged. Don't go back there. God's not going back there. God's not going there with you. If you've accepted the Lord, he's not going there anymore. There is no thrown off judgment. So don't you go back there. God's always looking forward, man. Yeah. Yeah, you messed up, but let's go. Grace. Let the grace of God. God's grace is an ocean of grace that washes away that sin, guys. An ocean. There's no lack. You ever go to the ocean? You ever, even a lake sometimes, right? The ocean is just the, the, to the horizon. It's just water. It's like, whoa. That's the grace that God has on us. It's complete. It's thorough. It's beautiful. Insecurity, yeah, all these things. Insecurity, fear, anxiety. Uh, you name it. It's, be, it's ironic. The more you stop focusing on self and you focus on the Lord, it's like everything changes because this is changing. This is changing. Your spirit is changing. And outwardly, maybe nothing's changed yet, but you're in a different, you're in a different place. And now that thing that would have sent you in a tailspin isn't there anymore. That's grace. Oh, that's beautiful. Walk in the grace of God. That's the way to go.